Streaming Live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America. Bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running, nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Ben Crossman, and everyone out there, thank you so much for tuning in. So today on the program, it is Tuesday, and it's the uh, first or second Tuesday. I'm pretty sure it's the first Tuesday of the month, which means Gamer Tuesday. Uh, you know, we, we, of course, take all the liberty we need to turn any Tuesday into Gamer Tuesday. And that is where we talk about everything video games. We talk about new releases. We talk about uh, a lot of uh, topics going on with the gaming industry. Overall, it's if you are in any way related to the gaming ecosystem, conversation, whatever, this is going to be a great show for you. So everyone, welcome into the Computer America Show. And we have none other than Corey Gallagher. He is, of course, our resident gaming correspondent and, and of course, a, um, a writer for Popzar Magazine. So everyone, before we get started, though, first things first, ComputerAmerica.com. That's where you'll find everything, including links to anything that we talk about here today, uh, links to our guest writing, uh, any articles that we show, any videos that we uh, display, just anything and everything will be found at ComputerAmerica.com. So check that out after the program. Also, be sure to check out the live video portion. We're going to be showing a lot of these games. Uh, you know, seeing is believing, and when we talk about video games, lots of uh, trailers, lots of teasers, and things like that. Uh, you definitely want to follow along. And last but not least, be sure to check out some of the articles and other content we have up on Computer America. So, all that being said, everyone, once again, welcome into the show. Uh, why don't we go ahead, bring our uh, correspondent on, and then we'll, of course, get started with today's conversation. And as I said before, he is a longtime Computer America correspondent. He is our resident gaming uh, expert and just all around great guy to talk to. Everyone, once again, Corey Gallagher. Corey, thank you for uh, joining us. Hey, Ben. Thank you so much for having me on the show once again. Uh, I missed last month, but now we are back here to talk about some video games. The past is the past, and we are happy that you are with us today. So, hey, it's uh, a lot to talk about, and I'm happy that you could join us. So, But before we get started, I have to ask you, how you been? Is everything going well? Um, you know, I recently moved, got a nice house, uh, been playing a lot of video games in it, doing my thing. So, yeah, <laughs> no, I'm doing great. It's been a wonderful time. That's great to hear. That's great to hear. And I think with that being said, uh, I, you know, and, and how about we start off the conversation like this? Uh, any new games that you and I have personally played? Because I know that you do review games, uh, you know, on a regular basis for Popzar, uh, you know, Popzar.com. But, uh, you know, just either for your passion or things that you've reviewed, why don't we go ahead and start off with new games that you've played, not even so much that they might be new altogether just you know what have you been playing lately well one of the most interesting games i've been playing lately there was a game that came out back around man i want to say 2006 maybe a game called city of heroes um city released of by heroes. a company called nc soft who are kind of known for bringing out these mmorpgs massively multiplayer online games uh letting them run for a few years and shutting them down to become unprofitable <laughs> um that's what happened to City of Heroes. Uh, so for the longest time, I want to say maybe the past 10 years, you could not play City of Heroes in any form. And so you couldn't play it, and I guess now there's a way to play it, I, I assume. Absolutely. See, uh, it turns out, when City of Heroes shut down, there was discussion about making a private server, about releasing the game so you could uh, run your own server and your friends could play with you and so on and so forth. But... We were under the impression that that wasn't possible, that the code necessary to do so didn't exist. Mm -hmm. It came out, I want to say two weeks ago, that not only does that code still exist, but people have been running secret servers for this game for the past, what, six years now. It's crazy. 
that's a that is a suspiciously well kept secret for for internet communities. Uh, it, and of course, the only thing I have to draw reference to is uh, things like uh, private servers for a lot of other MMOs and a lot of other games uh, frowned upon. And as soon as they get too much attention, they get shut down very very quickly by the lawyers. But uh, six years is a long time to keep you know things hush hush. Yeah, it absolutely is. Um, but as it turns out, the secret couldn't be kept forever. The code that was necessary to play the game has leaked. Uh, it is now possible to find several different servers you can play City of Heroes on. Uh, hilariously enough, when the code was first released and uh, you could get onto the server to play yourself, one of the loading screen tips said, this server is a secret. Make sure you keep it that way. Mm. Well, I'm glad that we would never go on to a nationally syndicated radio talk show and talk about private servers, but uh, I will say that yeah, private servers are like one of these things that uh, it really shows a fan base that you know they're still interested in this game, and even if there's no, well, there shouldn't be any monetary incentive to run a private server, uh, being able to play your favorite game and continuing with a community, uh, that's something that you don't need a large company for. Someone could do this out of their house and you know uh, provide a server for hundreds or thousands of other players it's just when you get to you know who actually owns it and if you should make money off of it and so on and so forth uh it gets a little tricky with uh you know with these kinds of topics Right, absolutely. Yeah, these things can get very complicated. That's one. There was a lot of, there was definitely some scares uh, and see stuff coming after people with legal threats, things like that. But uh, these days, it looks like one way or the other, you can find a way to play City of Heroes, a game yeah. that you could not play for almost a decade. That's you know, that's a miracle of modern technology, if you ask me. So there you go. So there's a game that may not be recent, but uh, recently uncovered, I guess, would be the best way to put that in something that you're playing uh, personally. And I'm going to ask you if you've uh, played either one of these, and these two have been sucking up the rest of my time that isn't spent doing uh, productive things. Uh, Slay the Spire and uh, Darkest Dungeon. I, I don't know if you've tried either one of those uh i have played both of those i am uh very fond of slay the spire it's uh, for those of you out there who haven't played it it's basically a a dungeon crawler card game where you assemble of assemble a deck of attacks and skills that you can use to make mm -hmm. your way through a dungeon uh it's difficult you have to carefully plan your moves ration your resources so you don't die early yep darkest dungeon on the other hand is a it's a similar concept you are exploring a dungeon it's a more of a traditional turn-based role-playing game Interesting in the sense that if any of your characters die, they are permanently dead. They do not come back. Uh, how much of Darkest Dungeon have you played, Ben? Oh, I am just getting into the later stages of it. I, I would say I have probably 10, 15 hours on it. Um, I, I'll be honest. I'm having trouble finding the... Uh, the fortitude to continue because the the gameplay is getting a little repetitive like uh you know for like a 20 dollar game uh getting 20 hours out of it pretty good but i'm finding it a, just a little bit too repetitive even before i get to like i know there's like an endless mode uh that you can take advantage of but i have not beaten the game and i've not taken part in the endless mode but uh decently far yeah darkest dungeon has a very interesting twist toward the end that i'm not going to spoil but i uh, just look forward to it you're going to love it Okay, I, I'll, I'll have to muscle through. I'll have to do that. So, uh, okay, so those are the games that we're playing lately. Obviously, nothing, ha you know, we don't have to be cutting edge all the time, but I will say, want to be, you know, switch over to cutting edge and talk about, well, Borderlands 3. And this is one where, uh, when it comes to looters and shooters, I mean, like, whenever people describe what they really envisioned Destiny 2, and uh, we're going to talk about Borderlands, but Destiny 2, uh, people were really hoping it was going to be a mix between Halo and Borderlands. Like, that was the dream. And it's, you know, Halo is a great person, person shooter. Borderlands is a great kind of just shower you with loot kind of, uh, kind of environment. And when it comes to that kind of gameplay, nothing really beat Borderlands 1 or 2. It, it was the best of the best. So people are rightfully so excited about Borderlands 3. Uh, you put revealed here. What was revealed? Uh, do we have release date? Do we have any kind of gameplay? Uh, what about Borderlands 3 made the news? Uh, since we last talked, pretty much everything about Borderlands 3 has made the news. Um, <laughs> the fact that it officially exists is one thing. Uh, we know a little bit of snippet. We know some snippets about the plot. We know some of the playable characters. We have uh, we've seen some gameplay. So 
we went in the course of a month from this game is probably being made to, wow, this game is definitely being made. And I'm pretty sure we're playing it by the end of the year. I'd have to check exactly when it's being released, but I think it's almost finished. I am looking forward to that. And, and of course, uh, for anyone out there watching the, the video portion of the show, we are going to go ahead and uh, we're going to go ahead and just kind of, uh, I guess, kind of mooch off the video in the, uh, the, gameplay that has been released and you can see here giant city uh it's still cell shaded uh, the very stylized cartoonish kind of look you know seems to still be there uh just overall borderlands 3 before you know we even get into any kind of like uh, specifics i mean it's kind of hard to match up a, a franchise like this like you just keep adding to uh the character that the game kind of naturally has uh Everything looking okay so far? I, I mean, obviously very, very early, but uh, gameplay-wise and skill-wise and character-wise, everything seemed to be staying the course? I mean, as far as I could tell, based on the snippets of gameplay that we've seen, it looks to be more of the same, which is exactly what people seem to have wanted. Um, nope. Uh, yeah, no. Uh, more of what we want, of course. Uh, looks like, and according to this article here that we'll include in the show notes, uh, Borderland 3's release date set for September 13th. Uh, that's a bit early, like earlier than I would have expected. I would have placed it somewhere in the uh, November time time frame, you know, to really hit that uh, to really hit that holiday sale time frame just nicely. But hey, I'm never going to complain about uh, Borderlands and video game development happening faster than I was anticipating. Uh, so right. with, yeah. Hmm? Absolutely. And uh, the other aspect of that is, I mean, I don't even know if it's happening faster than we we're anticipating. I think it's more the sense that uh, it's probably been being developed for years now behind the scenes. Yeah, no. I, and obviously when a game comes out like this and, you know, this big, uh, I don't know what they're actually adding you know, to the back end because so many games lately, like when they come out, they really aren't in their finished form as we would consider that, you know, maybe five, ten years ago, games coming out completely, you know, on one disc and you're good to go. But as far as, you know, because they'll add content every couple months and things like that, but it looks like it's definitely been you know been developed and polished and that kind of thing uh they're going to do that for the next uh four months now it's not even that far away four or five months and hey i'm looking forward to did you like borderlands one and two i did i liked them quite a bit um i found that i enjoyed borderlands one a little bit more than two i thought the guns were more interesting borderlands two has this uh this kind of sense that there are variations on a set of guns. Borderlands 1 feels more like there are many different guns, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But um, no, Borderlands I, 3 looks like it's going back to the uh, Borderlands 1 style of just, wow, we're going to go completely crazy with your weapons. We're going to give you insane things like a, an underbarrel launcher that shoots guns that shoot guns. Just crazy stuff <laughs> like that. So that's very exciting to me. And uh, based on what I've seen, it looks like it's fun to play. It's got a wide variety of skills, as we can see in the video now. Yeah, it just looks really interesting. Yeah, no, it certainly does. And one of my favorite part were always the skill trees and, you know, kind of mixing some of that uh, action RPG with first person shooter that, like I said, no one really does quite like uh, Borderlands. So I'm, I'm looking forward to this and I hope that the online or, or at least the multiplayer, uh, I'll be honest, I didn't play much of Borderlands 2, uh, just whatever I can snag here and there. But I'm hoping that the, the multiplayer aspects of it, uh, it doesn't feel too grindy. I hope it's really repeatable uh, and, you know... I hope it has staying power, I guess is the way. Because Borderlands 1 and 2 both did. It's just, I feel like Borderlands 3 is going to have to have that staying power on top of a good multiplayer to, you know, I guess kind of stick around. So, Absolutely. I mean, I feel exactly the same way. I'm hoping it's got a, I'm hoping I pay my $60 or whatever and get hundreds of hours out of it. I'm looking forward to it. Looking forward to that as well. So, okay, there's Borderlands 3 revealed. I'm sure that, uh, you know, when it comes out, Popstar is going to have a good review out. You're going to play it. I'm going to play it. And it's, it's going to be great. Uh, oh, and by the way, uh, let's see, somewhere in the article here, PC, uh, PlayStation 4, and Xbox One. So console and uh, PC. So nothing exclusive, which is great to see. Uh, love to hear that. Now, another new release uh, just came out, I want to say about two weeks ago. It, it's been pretty common, uh, or, or I'm sorry, it's been pretty recent, but I got to say Mortal Kombat 11. And anyone who who's listened to the show when we talked about this being, uh, well, the Mortal Kombat franchise being inducted into the uh, the Hall of, you know, 
the Video Game Hall of Fame, which we'll add to in just a second. But uh, I have a soft spot for Mortal Kombat. It was like one of the first things. I was like six years old with a Game Boy, and that was one of my first games. I loved it. I loved the movie. It was cheesy. It was great. And Mortal Kombat has gotten a reputation for you know kind of over the top graphics. That's where you may have seen some of the more recent articles saying, "Hey, is it okay that we really rip a guy in half and with a saw blade and you know uses entrails and as, as confetti? Like it, it's it's over the top, but it's kind of B movie." B horror movie cheesy kind of graphics. Uh, it's fun. It's a great fighting game. It's uh, it, it's gory. It's inhumane. It's uh, it's fun for the whole family. But you have an article here. Uh, Mortal Kombat 11 receives reward revamp. So uh, this is part that I really don't know. Um, I only know about like the gameplay and how it looks and the finishers and things like that. I really don't know about like uh, the incentives to keep playing, which I guess is what they're hitting on here. Uh, what happened? Well, to really understand this article, um, I kind of have to explain a concept that's gotten really big in games lately. That's the concept of a game as a service. Uh, Mm -hmm. What that means is that it's pretty typical these days for every big released game to really want to be the only game that you play ever. It's it's like, you know, Destiny 2 comes out. We only want you playing Destiny 2. We want your gaming life and maybe your real life to revolve around playing Destiny 2. And to do that, we're going to implement systems that keep you playing. Uh, we've seen this before with games like Farmville back when uh, Zynga was big. Uh, mm-hmm. We've seen it with mobile phone games these days, and now we've seen it in Mortal Kombat 11. Uh, in particular, uh, when you play Mortal Kombat 11, if you play the game at all, you get coins. If you win a match, you get souls. If you do a fatality, you get hearts. These can be used to unlock things in a section of the game called the Crypt, which has just a bunch of treasure chests. You open them up with your different currencies and yada, yada, yada. Mm-hmm. So Here's the boxes. issue. Initially... The amount of these currencies that you got for playing the game was fairly minimal. Um, it would take you a long time to accumulate much of anything, so you could open any chest and unlock anything. You couldn't. Uh, you'd have trouble getting skins for your characters to make them look unique. You'd have trouble getting customization items. You'd have trouble getting anything really without playing for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. So, so uh, I, right. and and yeah, so, uh, sorry to step on your feet here, but this is not the first time that we've heard about this, and I'm sure that you were going to bring it up even without my prompting. But uh, uh, Battlefield Two, uh, the Star Wars, or uh, I'm sorry, Battlefront Two, uh, Star Wars Battlefront Two, uh, had the same deal where people were complaining that you know they were essentially time time gating uh, core parts of the game or even customization of the game, and it was just taking like. 40 hours to unlock one playable character and it was it was take hundreds or thousands of hours to get all the customization uh we've heard this before is what i'm trying to say um it's not quite the same concept though the i guess the overall push is the same yes the idea is that it will take you so long to accumulate the currency that you need to buy stuff that maybe if an alternative is offered to you in the form of currency that you can just pay for with real money Maybe you can use that to get the stuff that you want. And I don't want to confuse anybody. This is not the same thing as, my, as Battlefield 2, okay. Battlefront 2, sorry. Um, the stuff that you can buy with real currency is open. You can see what you're going to get. It's not a matter of gambling. I got you. What you could buy is right there in front of you. Um, the issue is twofold. First off, you can only buy one th- right, you can only buy out of a given selection of items per day. So you can't really tell what's going to be for, uh, be sold for real money. <laughs> The other aspect of it, of course, is you're making me you're making me want to pay real money for this stuff in this game instead of just making it reasonable for me to grind for the stuff, uh, play the game a lot. In other words, grind. Right. Um, yeah, uh, a lot of people thought that was unethical. Um, well, and you and, know, and I, I think the the idea that game oh, companies are unethical and anti consumers these days is a little bit uh a little bit outplayed. Uh, we we've heard a lot about it. It's we it's the well that we go to every single time a game company does anything somebody doesn't <laughs> like. Um, and in this case, you know, I, I played the game for a while before the revamps happened. And honestly, I didn't know if it was that bad myself. That I like Mortal Kombat and I would play it a lot anyway. Anyway, right. so people complained a lot. And about a week after the game was released, the company that made it, NetherRealm Studios, decided that they're going to fix it. And what they did is they tripled the amount of pretty much every currency that you get for doing anything. Uh, meaning that now, I guess you could pay real money if you really, really wanted to, but, um, I, I wouldn't. Right. 
yeah. yeah. And uh, we saw something similar happen with Battlefront 2 where they just put out all the stops to kind of revamp the game into a form where you don't have to pay for stuff. Uh, the difference there, again, is that Battlefront 2 was not only kind of a gambling system, but it had stuff that affected gameplay. That is not the case here. Right. No, no. Uh, and, and a lot of it is... Uh, uh, a lot of it is just customizations, different skins, different looks, and things like that, which I'm sure, you know, if you have a favorite character and you have a favorite look for that character, uh, one thing that they are kind of being predatory about, I'm sure that you've heard the phrase and a lot of people out there have as well, but it's a phenomenon known as fear of missing out. It's this idea that if you don't get it today, it may be weeks, months, years, or however, uh, whatever the rotation of the stock in the store would be, fear of missing out of, you know, not being able to, who knows when I'll be able to get this skin again if I don't get it today. So uh, it's mixing a couple of different, you know, uh, predatory psychology it, that are, like you said, very prevalent in video games lately. Uh, just about every, especially free to play, uh, you know, free to play is a whole nother market. But uh, for a completely, and I assume Mortal Kombat 11 is, is, is about 60 bucks, uh, 60 bucks. And on top of that, there's an in game currency, which is standard. I'm not riffing. You know, I'm I'm not going to rip it a new one because uh, it it's sixty bucks and it has in-game currency. But um, you know, like you said, you should feel like if you if you like it, you can spend money on it. But you shouldn't feel forced to, which I guess is why they tripled everything. Uh, good, I guess. Good, good that they reacted to uh, people saying it was too slow. See, I think an important thing to keep in mind here is that uh, the time frame that I gave. I think that's important. Um, they, quote-unquote, fixed this a week after the game came out. And a lot of people will buy the game, and then they'll spend their money shortly after the game comes out, maybe even on launch day. Mm -hmm. So if your currency rates are really low in the first week when the games come out and it's most popular – it suggests to me that that's when they're going to make the most money. And we know for a fact that games sell the most within the first, I think, two weeks of release. Right. So I, I don't want to ascribe any, you know, weird motivations to anybody, <laughs> but I would presume that they knew they were going to do this, that they brought the game out with these low rates intentionally to make as much as they could off people who had to have these skins now, now, now. And then a week later, like, oh, by the way, we're going to roll this on back. See, we're, we're good consumers and so on and so forth. You know what I mean? Yeah, okay, so you think that they're going for the easy points by, uh, you know, by creating a, a controversy that, hey, side effect may earn them a bit of money by people who are impatient. And then they also get some free goodwill by, uh, by fixing the problem that shouldn't have been, you know, that should have been caught way before. Uh, and, and if you're wondering out there, how do you catch this before you release it to the audience at large? Well, you sit down, you play the game, and you have maybe, you know, either your internal testing team or friends and family, and you look at it and go, you know, I've been playing for 20 hours, and I've gotten, uh, you know, only about five cosmetics. This is way too low for the amount of time I've put in. Uh, you think that this should have been caught, and maybe, just maybe, it's uh, just a little bit planned, or, you know, they were expecting this at some rate. Um, I don't know that a game with the kind of budget that went into this one did not have anybody play testing it. Um, and, but I do know that uh, behavioral economy is a thing in games now that we uh, that we've definitely seen examples of companies doing things like, hey, we should maybe pick the rates too low for the first week, but we'll quote unquote fix them later so we look good to everybody, the shareholders and the uh, I don't like using the term, but the gamers. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that would be a surprise. Um, but at the same time, I, I gotta be honest here. I love Mortal Kombat 11. I gave it an editor's choice award in Pop Zara. Uh, I have to admit you can abuse me as much as you want game developers. If it's a good <laughs> enough game, I'll still play it. Sorry. Well, no. And, and of course, uh, just, it, we were talking about the currency part of it, but you know, this is the first time that you've been on the show since it was released. Uh, Mortal Kombat 11. I mean, just kind of from a gameplay standpoint, uh, maybe if there's a single player, you know, usually there's some kind of like ladder and some kind of flimsy story, uh, to put every character in front of you, but just kind of in, let's put it in terms of other Mortal Kombat releases, usually about like every other one is really, really good. And then every other one is like kind of yeah, I'll wait till the other one. That's really, really good. Uh, Mortal Kombat 11, you gave it an editor's choice. I mean, what what did Mortal Kombat 11 do well? 
Mortal Kombat 11 is a solid game all around. It's got a great fighting system and has an excellent story mode, as we've seen with the, with the last two Mortal Kombat games, Mortal Kombat 2011 and Mortal Kombat X, both uh, just the height of the industry for story modes and fighting games. It's basically a film that you get to play. It's wonderful. Um, like I said, really well-designed fighting. It's got a lot of content. Um, right. and by that I mean... We talked about how there's a lot of cosmetics and a lot of skins that you can acquire. Um, the game goes out of its way to give you alternative ways to acquire much of this thing, much of this stuff. You can find it in the crypt with the currency, like I was talking about. You can play in a bunch of randomly generated tournaments called Towers of Time that might unlock this stuff. You can create your own AI fighter by modifying how it behaves and earn stuff that way. There's a lot to do. And... From that perspective, I mean, I, I know why games do this. Again, games want to be the only game you ever play, but it doesn't mean I don't appreciate it. You know, I'm glad it's there. If you're going to pay money for a game, you should get a lot to do with it, if you ask me. Right. Right. No, no, no. Makes makes perfect sense. Obviously, games are still one of the, the best uh, forms of entertainment that you will get your money's return on. You know, if you go out there and see a movie, uh, you're paying 12 bucks for the ticket or 10 bucks or eight bucks if you live in a small town. And still, even with, let's say, eight bucks, let's say your movie is end game and you just watch a three hour movie, that's still, what, $2 to, you know, two, two and two thirds, two dollars and 66 cents for an hour of entertainment. Whereas video games, if you spend money like a $60 game, Mortal Kombat 11, maybe you'll get 100 hours out of it, maybe more, maybe less. But hey, that's still way more cost effective for the money that you spend. That, As long as that equation holds true, a large portion of the game of, of the gaming audience will continue to you know flock to new games just because, hey, it's, uh, it's cheap. It, it, it's a cheap thrill. So there you go, Mortal Kombat 11. I'm glad that you liked it. I definitely enjoy, you know, watching people play it. I, my my button mashing days, I don't think they were ever here, but they're definitely gone by now. But Mortal Mortal Kombat, when it comes to the animations and just the the vulgarity that they put on screen in front of you, I love it. So there you go. Uh, now, why don't we go ahead and, you know, this may take us through to the end, uh, you know, well, to the break at least. But, uh, Corey, I'm sure that you heard uh, the Video Game Hall of Fame. I'm not sure exactly who runs it. I should probably know that. Uh, but the Video Game Hall of Fame, they, and uh, I really wish I knew who owned it, uh, Mu National Museum of uh, The Video Play. Game Hall of Fame is run by the Strong Museum. The strong. Oh, there you go. So yeah, they recently inducted uh, four new inductees into the Hall of Fame, and I wanted to go through each one. You know, just kind of get reaction. But you know, in the past, they have uh, and, and there's a full list here that we'll go ahead and throw up on the screen if anyone would like to check out the full list. But some of the uh, you know some of the highlights include things like Pac-Man, Oregon Trail, Legend of Zelda, Street Fighter Two, Super Mario Brothers, Tetris. You know, like they are. They're not just popular, but they were innovative in their own way, and just every like they're kind of like a cultural touchstone. Like they they span generations, they span audiences, continents, whatever. That's the point. It's hard to look at you know what makes a game good and say this is what makes it Hall of Fame worthy. So I wanted to go through the last four and see you know one by one and see uh, does it deserve to be there. And one of them, I, I'm sure you're like me, you're like Colossal Cave Adventure, and we'll go ahead and start there. Um, I didn't know anything about it, but it seems to be kind of like the grandfather time of text-based ad adventure games. Uh, Colossal Cave Adventure, did you have any experience with this whatsoever? Because I sure as heck didn't. Uh, I'm afraid not. I mean, I'm looking over the inductees to the Video Game Hall of Fame right now because I was familiar with who ran it. I wasn't too familiar with the inductees themselves. And, um, <laughs> you know, it's funny. Um, it, they, 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 they went with the safe picks. They went with all the safe choices. Um, we know <laughs> that museum attendance has gone down. And what's a great way to get people to go to a museum appeal to the kids with right. video games right, but uh, right, right. at the same time i mean they've, they've got final fantasy 7 on here so they probably know what they're talking about it's cool 
No, the 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 past ones, and, and that's just the thing where uh, it, it's just like kind of like the the toy museum. I'm sure where uh, like a couple of years ago they inducted uh, the to- like in the toy museum they inducted like uh, the radio flyer red wagon. They inducted the uh, the cup with the ball on the string. They inducted the you know the stick. I think made it into the toy hall of fame, like. It's hard to pick in such a clustered field, such as toys or video games, because everyone everyone's going to be biased. But to pick, you know, kind of like a subset. And by the way, Corey, there's music playing in the background. We'll come back. We'll go over the four inductees, and then we'll go ahead and move on to our next topic. But everyone, we are doing, of course, Gamer Tuesday. This is Everything Video Games with Corey Gallagher from Popzara. Everyone, stay tuned. More right after the break. Everyone, we'll be right back. Greece is cheap. But the airfare costs a fortune. Paris? Not much closer, and again, airfare... What about Puerto Vallarta? Let's face it, flying anywhere is just too expensive. Wait, what's this? Low-cost airlines. With one call to low-cost airlines, you'll drastically slash your travel costs. We're talking insanely low airline prices to any of your favorite destinations. Where would you like to go? London, Rome, Costa Rica, Australia? Wow, that's cheap. So why wait? Call now to learn how crazy cheap it is to fly anywhere in the U.S. or international. Our prices are so low, we can't publish them. The only way to get them is to call to instantly hear the most amazing best deals on airlines travel. It's that easy. So call now and start packing. 800-215-4461. 800-215-4461. 800-215-4461. That's 800-215-4461. We are all Brother Wolf. Ten years ago, a group of locals banded together to create positive change. We took animals into our homes, held adoption events at local retailers, and talked to the community about our mission to help build a no-kill Asheville. A decade later, we have achieved so many victories for animals in need. There's been so much progress, yet there's still so much to do. As part of our year-long celebration, we encourage you to become a member of our special Compassionate Circle program. With a monthly donation of $10 or more, you will have behind-the-scenes access to the work we are doing at Brother Wolf. Our goal is to reach 1,000 members because we receive no government funding. Working together, we can help build and sustain no-kill communities. Learn more at CompassionateCircle.BWAR.org. We are a 501c3 tax-deductible organization. And welcome back to the Computer America Show. It is 32 minutes past the hour as we continue on here. And everyone, if you missed any part of our conversation so far, please, 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 wherever podcasts are heard, simply search Computer America. And you can find today's show, yesterday's shows, tomorrow's show, all shows wherever podcasts are heard. So check that out. Now we continue on, Corey Gallagher and everyone. We, uh, yeah, hey, we are, of course, talking the Video Game Hall of Fame. They, if you haven't heard, uh, just a couple of days ago, I think like two days ago, they uh, released who they they will be introducing, uh, or at least the, the titles they will be introducing to the Hall of Fame, and they already join many uh, very, very popular games. So with that being said, uh, let's just get the first one out of the way, Corey. Coloss- uh, Colossal Cave Adventure, it's a little bit before your time, before my time. 1977, I think, was when it was released. Uh, it, it must have been cool. But I think the other three, both of us should be more familiar with. Uh, first things first, Microsoft Windows Solitaire. Safe pick, like you said. I like it. Uh, so Colossal Cave Adventure appears to run on a cassette tape? I bet it did. <laughs> I, that's what the picture is, is it's a cassette tape. I, 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 don't, I don't know. Uh, Microsoft Solitaire, though, that's... Um, you know, when I was younger, I'd see my folks play it, and I was always like, why would you play something so boring? And then I tried it myself when I got older, and I was like, why would I play something so boring? So um, Mortal Kombat, though, that's some good stuff. Super into it, as you know, we, we just talked about. Love it. Love Mortal Kombat 11. It's a good game. Oh, everybody should give it a shot. Uh, they fix the currency. Don't worry about that. Uh, Super Mario Kart. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not a surprise either. The newest one of those in the Switch has sold like gangbusters. It's a significant game. It spawned a lot of Me Too's and sequels. So, 
yeah solid yeah no no so uh, you're absolutely right and uh and, and i will say that all those like uh, well uh, solitaire is still being played you know there's uh, there's new iterations of it just like tetris being created every single year uh year over year it and i think that's another another consideration for the museum is that it has to have staying power like it has to still be kind of relevant in today's day and age where mortal kombat you know just had a game released uh super mario kart just had a game released and uh colossal cave adventure text-based games just like books will never go out of style it's uh you know it's just like that so but i do wanted to touch real quick for everyone out there who's really, really mad that their favorite game didn't get inducted, well, they only take a handful every single year, and some of the ones that were on the panel but were excluded this year doesn't mean that they won't be next year. Uh, Centipede, great, I loved it. Uh, Dance Dance Revolution, I think that one's definitely going to make it next year. Half Life, I'm sure that you have a fa- a soft spot for Half Life and Half Life Two. Uh, Mist, NBA 2K, Sid Meier, Civilization, Civilization definitely needs to be in there, Candy Crush Saga, uh, Ruined a Generation, and we love them for it, and Super uh, Smash Brothers Melee as well. Uh, Maybe next year for these. (laughs) It's entirely possible. Um, I would have to do some more research to see exactly what leads them to induct certain games and what are what are their criteria i actually don't know i have no I, idea i think they have a panel of experts and they vote and they you know just kind of everyone gets together and makes a top 10 list and compares numbers i'm sure that there is a grading criteria that we don't know but um all of them seem like, like there's not one in there that i'm like that should never be in there like i don't know maybe i'm just super into video games and it's just all video games have a have a certain niche and you know everyone should respect that so with that being said though uh you know and hey because we're talking about new releases and i know we got a little sidetracked there with the video game hall of fame i did want to point out one other uh new release that maybe you've heard of Corey, maybe you haven't uh it's been getting popular but i think it's only going to get it's going to get more popular and then i think it's going to have a tragic end <coughs> sorry about that it's going to have like a black plague. It's just going to have a tragic ending. Uh, but it's a game called Mordhau. Uh, Mordhau, if you haven't heard of it, it's a hack, it's a hack and slash. It's a, it has like a VR component, if that kind of gets you uh, a better idea, where it's first person uh, and it's like it's first person. You can have any kind of medieval weapon, mace, uh, giant hammer, sword, pole arm, what, or halberd, whatever you want. And essentially... It's very good at putting you up against other real players in either a giant, you know, a 32 by 32 brawl or you could have like a one on one skirmishes. And yeah, you get to essentially role play as a as a soldier. And yeah, you get to bash other people's heads in or cut their heads off or you know, sm- stab them through the gut. Uh, it's getting really popular. Five hundred thousand thousand copies sold since april 29th not bad for a game that really no one was uh you know no one was really looking looking at so uh did, did you see any of this Corey? you know um i've seen friends playing the game i haven't tried it myself yet i knew it was popular but i didn't expect it was this popular I don't think anyone did, and and as I said, you know, they even had a uh, an official post uh, quote as of today. Mordhout has sold just shy of five hundred thousand copies and reached a peak sixty thousand concurrent players. And as I said, we haven't fully realized that Mordhout is currently among the top played games on Steam. So, uh, yeah, you know, I think it's one of those games where there's not really a lot of depth to it. But at the same time, the physics are really, really good. Like, uh, the hitboxes are tight. Um, If you slash or faint with a sword and you take someone's head off, their head does come off. And you don't feel like, wow, the game cheated me. No, it's more like I got outplayed by the, like, I just, they were just better at that point. And that leads to a lot of replayability. So, um, looks pretty cool. And uh, there was another game kind of like it uh, a little while ago that kind of died uh where you could play as like a samurai or like a a, a medieval knight but um yeah I, new releases mordhau maybe give it a shot um it looks like a game that if you enjoy the the controls of it and you enjoy how it plays maybe you'll get a lot out of it but of course continued content is going to be a big thing here 
Absolutely. More Tower reminds me a lot of a game that came out a little while back called Chivalry. That's um, it. Game yeah. did well. Um, they actually released an official sequel to Chivalry called Mirage Arcane Warfare that completely flopped. So it's nice to see another one of these games coming out. Uh, the one you were talking about is For Honor from Ubisoft. Um, I think that one is actually still going strong. Yeah, it, it, it is. No, uh, it has a, it, I don't want to say thriving, but it has a strong uh, has a strong online player base that still very, very much loves it. And it's one of those games that, uh, you know, like I said, the physics are good. Now they just need to put in the content to, uh, you know, to, to make it last. Because, yes, it's fun to put 32 against 32 people. And sometimes when your friends get covered in blood and you're, you know, it's red versus blue and your blue guys start looking red because they're covered in blood and you accidentally hit them in the back. Uh, it's fun, but you need some variety in there. So, Mordhau, uh, again, just kind of new releases. I wanted to uh, to bring that up. Uh, and actually, why don't we go ahead and continue on with this theme and save our irateness, our anger, our frustration, and let's just, uh, you know, per your topics, Corey, uh, recent and upcoming releases, since that's kind of what we're doing anyways. Uh, you have one here called Days Gone gone which uh you know i saw on steam it uh it, it had a decent level of viewers but overall it faded fairly quickly from the conversation uh what is days gone and it, it is my initial impression of not really paying attention is that kind of unjustified days gone is a zombie game it's a game about zombies um that's i, I pretty much just summarized the whole thing for you there was a period <laughs> Back, I want to say maybe 10 years ago, uh, 2009 or so, when pretty much every game that came out was a zombie game. There were zombie movies, there were zombie games, zombie books, zombie everything. It was a big craze. And that just kind of stuck around for a while. And now we've got Days Gone, which feels like a holdover from those days. It's uh, it, it, you, you play as a biker, there are zombies, there's a plot, it's all right. Um, there's it, a plot if you want one. <laughs> yeah, there's a plot if you want one. It's an open world kind of game where you can explore and discover things to do and you fight a lot of uh, enemy survivors because, you know, The Walking Dead is a thing. So the enemies are never the zombies anymore. It's other survivors. Um, it, it feels like a knockoff Walking Dead game. And, I, you know, the it's well polished. It's a fun game. It's made well. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't really do anything that hasn't already been done. Yeah, that seemed to be, uh, well, I guess that would kind of lead to why it didn't kind of stick around, but um, I, I don't know, zombie games are, are kind of like first person shooters, you know, kind of like your Call of Duties, your Battlefields, or some other genres, like there's always a new one for the year, but uh, it doesn't last long enough for the next year one to come out, so uh, did you review this one, did you give it a try? I did. I played a fair amount of it. I reviewed it for Pop Zara. I gave it a yay, which is the, a step below our Editor's Choice Award. Basically means that if you pay your money for this game, you will have a good time with it. And again, doesn't have to do anything super new or fresh to be fun. It just has to be well made. And Days Gone certainly is. And I mean, God knows it had enough money behind it, so that's not surprising. Right. Oh, there yeah. you go. But in terms of... Uh, mm -hmm. In terms of like being Game of the Year or anything like that, no. <laughs> it's people are gonna have forgotten about it in a month. That's just how it is, I'm afraid. Yeah. So it's uh, it it's another game for well, and and really there are dry spells in games. Um, I think for the holiday season there's a big rush on the consoles. For the spring there's a bunch for you know kind of PCs and things like that. Uh, we need stuff to fill out the middle. So it, it's it's not bad to be you know uh, another well made game. It's uh, there's nothing wrong with that. So there you go. I'm, I'm never gonna complain about a new. Right. So w with that being said, uh, let's see. So I did want to highlight one other uh, game out there, although it's not really new, but uh, parts of it are new. I haven't checked out myself. I really, really, really need to. And this is an article uh, I pulled up from PC Gamer that, uh, you know, that kind of showed it off here. But uh, I'm sure that you've played Overwatch. Overwatch, um, I really, really like it. I haven't gotten, gotten into the latest uh, season, but um, they introduced something new, and it's uh, the workshop, where you can add different elements to the way that... Uh, you can add different elements to, to the way the characters play. And a, a joke that I saw was something along the lines of, uh, you, uh, Blizzard said, you don't like our balancing? Fine, you can go ahead and, uh, and balance it yourself. So 
essentially the, the workshop lets you combine effects. It lets you do different things. It lets you make crazy scenarios. It's essentially, uh, and I'm not sure if you've ever, uh, if you recall the Warcraft 3 map editor, but you can do whatever you want in, in Overwatch. And really, you can then share your creations. Like it, it's it's not just, uh, you know, you make it, no one else gets to play it. No, you get to share it with other people. And uh, yeah, I really wanted to highlight it because it it gives people, I guess, kind of like a, a tool chest, uh, a playground, and they get to do whatever they want with it. And I like to see that kind of flexibility uh, from Blizzard games because think of all the different genres and games that came out of Warcraft 3 because people could make custom maps that spawned untold amount of games. So uh, I, I don't know if you've tried the workshop yet, Corey, but uh, everyone else out there, I'm going to recommend uh, giving it a look. You know, I haven't tried it yet. I was really big into Overwatch for the first couple months or so after it came out, and then it kind of fell off for me. But this is interesting, to be sure. The other interesting Overwatch news that I've heard have been rumors that Blizzard might announce more games in that same uh, in the same like franchise or uh, setting, in the same universe, which is cool. Yeah, same universe. That's the right term. Yeah. Uh, that's cool because uh, Blizzard has gone out of their way to really put a whole lot of backstory and cute little things to find and Easter eggs in the maps around Overwatch. But the fact of the matter is it's a team-based shooter. You can't really get a full-on story. So if they can take those ideas and put them into a game where you can actually like have a plot, some kind of driving force, get that that story that we all love from those character trailers from Overwatch into a game of itself, that sounds great. I'm all for that. You know, Blizzard didn't really do too well with their first cinematic uh, with their first cinematic release, the Warcraft movie. It made money thanks to China. Way to go, China! But overall, um, you know, people really didn't respond too too well to a Warcraft movie. But ever since Overwatch came out with those, you know, with those 10, 15 minute trailers, and trust me, there are a lot of them. If you haven't caught them, they're very, very well made and worth checking out. Just to, like even if you don't play the game, go check out the uh, the well, not trailers, but the uh, go 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 check out like the little shorts that they have released about the thing. Ever since like the first two or three of those, everyone's like they're going to make a movie out of this. Like they are going to make a movie out of Overwatch and it's uh I don't know if it's going to do any better, but they're going to do it. So I don't know about any other games. I didn't hear anything about that. Um I hope so. I mean, I think Overwatch the universe is very very complex. It's just I don't know enough yet and Blizzard plays things too close to the vest for me to really say, uh, man, this is going to be great because hey, you know, it could not be, but uh, I'm I'm looking forward to it. Like you, well, Ben, I love Overwatch. Ben. Let's be real here. Don't you have a phone? Uh yeah, yeah. Diablo Immortal, uh, Diablo Immortals. That's uh, yeah. What? Don't you guys have phones? That was such a flub, and hopefully they've learned from it. I hope that they've taken the meme and not just memed it, but learned from it. So there you go. Okay, so there's there's that one uh, again. Uh, any kind of recent upcoming releases, things like that. Looking looking over um, our notes here, we might include in the show notes that the Detective Pikachu movie, which I have not seen yet, I know uh, disastrous, but there's uh, Pokemon Go for the last remaining couple thousand players that play that. Uh, Pokemon Go will be uh, having some kind of tie-in with the Detective Pikachu movie with uh, uh, shiny Pokemon and in-game kind of things. Did you catch up? Did you catch Detective Pikachu? Because personally, I'm waiting until that hits uh, home theaters. You know, I haven't seen it yet, but I'll admit that I really want to. Um, I also really want to see the Sonic the Hedgehog movie, but I want to see these two <laughs> films for entirely different reasons, to be honest. <laughs> Yeah, it's one's an animated live action movie that does it, uh, suppo- what I hear, very, very well. And the other is a live action movie that looks so far to do it really, really bad. And I'm sure and that one is an uh, animated live action movie that looks great. The other one is Sonic the Hedgehog. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Sonic the Hedgehog. Did you, and of course, I'm sure that you heard uh, they're redoing it because the first trailer was just so atrocious. Um, I would. I would bet a significant amount of Mortal Kombat coins that they're not redoing anything, that they intentionally produced a questionable trailer so they can then release the actual trailer later and look good. This is the like age of Twitter. Like This is what people do these days. It wouldn't surprise me at all. 
Yeah, it it could be a marketing uh, a marketing strategy, and like you said uh, uh, about the whole gaming psychology or game psychology, uh, there could be a whole other thing when it comes to uh, internet outrage uh, outrage culture and the psychology behind it, and how we can utilize this for word of mouth. Uh, I bet that if Sonic looked okay, people would not talk about this new Sonic movie as much as they did if it looked horrible like it did. So I am, I'm, I'm kind of with you. Uh, it looked really, really bad, but at the same time, I, I don't know if I really expected anything more from Sonic. Sonic as a franchise does things really, really poorly. So I felt like it was a kind of a fitting trailer, though. So I don't know. T- tough call. Okay, but but Jim Carrey as Doctor Robotnik is pretty good, though. He nailed it, you know. And, and Jim Carrey, I hear that people don't like to work with him because he's kind of a diva and he uh, and he has a lot of demands and things like that. But I always enjoy watching him in movies. He he has a style, and him as Doctor Robotnik, uh, you know, he's not big and fat, but I'll forgive it because he does look really really really, really good in the trailer. So I definitely like that. So. Uh, there's that one. Uh, looking over some of these, uh, Minecraft might come out with an uh, with an augmented reality version. That's that's its own thing. Uh, hey, why don't we go ahead and talk about topics instead? And you had one listed. I wanted to, of course, uh, let you you know kind of uh, say your thing here with the Epic Game Store because since you were last on, the Epic Game Store has been uh, pulling titles from steam and other competitors uh, cutting deals with studios and games to be exclusively on the epic game store and essentially people are discussing the topic that is exclusivity when it comes to game stores uh when when steam was your only option in town uh people really didn't have this conversation now that there is the epic game store uh now people are again suddenly mad uh what did you want to talk about this Well, one of the more interesting things that happened with the Epic Games Store recently is the announcement that uh, Psyonic, which is the company that uh, developed the game Rocket League, a big hit a few years ago, still a big hit, uh, they are partnering up with the Epic Games Store now. So they're still going to sell on Steam. You can still play the game on Steam, but now it's also going to be on the Epic Games Store. Um, People were mad. Of course they were. Um, I'm looking at the Epic Games Store right now. Um, It's not really... A big deal. I said the same thing last time. Uh, the Epic Games launcher currently is taking up all of 200 megabytes of memory, and that's with all this animation and stuff going on. So uh, it's not really a big deal, guys. You yeah. got to relax. Well, um, I, I one I of the things. Sorry. But uh, yeah, no. Uh, j- I was just, I was just gonna say that one thing that uh, you know, Epic Games has been getting in, uh, has been trying to cut these deals where they are exclusively found on the Epic Game Store. So the problem there was that they take something that's very, very popular, something that's kind of beloved, almost like people who like uh, maybe Rainbow Six Siege, uh, you know, to name another game that kind of has that staying power. And they said, okay, the community likes it, is doing well here. Let's pay them enough money so that they become exclusive users of our platform. Like essentially they're paying for the community. Uh, Like you said though, that's not exactly happening. It's not going to be exclusive or uh, Rocket League won't be exclusive, but other developers have said that was the deal that Epic approached them with. Yeah, and again, I I never really understood the value in looking too deeply into the business side of things, the video game industry. I think that as the people whose job is to pay for and play the games, we have little to no effect on the store, or rather on the industry and how they decide to sell things. So it's, it's all hot air to me, really. Um, I have the Epic Game Store installed, I just mentioned. Um, I, there's a couple games I play on it. Hades is a favorite of mine, the new game from Supergiant, who made Transistor. Um, I have World War Z, which isn't too bad. Of course, Fortnite. Um, but the fact that I have to open up a different app to play these games is not the end of the world to me. And um, <laughs> Yeah. Oh, uh, Corey, did you cut out there? Uh Uh-oh, Corey might have cut out there. Uh, Hopefully, he'll be back in just a moment. But I will say... uh, Sorry about that. Did I cut out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You cut out. Oh, my mistake. Anyway, I was saying, um, I just kind of feel like the low-level outrage that surrounds the game store is eventually just going to die out. And people will just accept that, hey, here it is. 
it's got some games, different stores have others. It's been like that for years now with Uplay and Origin. Even GOG Games has exclusives. It's it's not the end of the world, guys. The the only thing I'm I'm kind of questioning is what's and and you know this may get into the business side a little bit, but what do the game stores get out of this? And the only thing I can think of are analytics. Like, uh, and maybe you could look at something like Netflix, where uh, Netflix is the only one that truly knows the analytics of you know what happens on their platform. Maybe the data of you know what's going on with uh, their player base and how often they're playing, what they're playing, when they're playing, blah blah blah. Maybe that's such an attractive set of data that having your own game store is super important. It's just why you know with steam out there and yes they were probably taking too much from developers for you know uh 70 30 uh, profit share but other than you know being outraged by profit share why do other people have to have their uh have to have these stores and the only thing i can i, I can think of are metrics so i guess oh i mean ben if uh if i have metro exodus right mm -hmm. and i sell it on both steam and the epic game store Right. And I run the Epic Game Store, and some people buy it on Steam. I'm not getting any cut. I'm not getting their money. But if I make it so you can only buy it on the Epic Game Store, and all copies come from the Epic Game Store, all the money from sales of that game on PC will go to me. That's why they do it. Okay, so 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 you're saying it's that 30% cut that Steam takes. You think that uh, that is a good enough motivator to open your own store? And hey, at this rate, uh, or, or I'm sorry, at this point in time. 2019 ladies and gentlemen uh you don't have to rely on the giants to get your game into people's hands so uh okay i i kind of get that so uh there's that and you're right there is kind of a low level simmering rage but uh we're going to ignore that because that's always there if you dig far enough so with that being said though uh, let's see, there was another discussion I wanted to have with you, and it was not about this PC hard drive, because uh, everyone, if you don't have a solid state drive by now, uh, just go get one. Uh, I wanted to talk about, let's see, let's see, let's see. Uh, yeah, uh, it was with not, actually, you know what, we only have like two minutes left, this is going to be a good enough one. Apex Legends, uh, I think that you played it, uh, I've played a fair amount of it, and I, I gotta say, I'm okay. I'm not great. I'm okay. But um, there were not that many cheaters. And I have to say, I think that's because Apex Legends had so many players. Like, it was free to play. Uh, it got a lot of traction. It got, it got a lot of attention right off the bat. Um, there were a lot of players. But we now have this new, uh, well, recent, uh, I would say about two or three days, about 773 thousand players have been banned from apex legends since its february 5th release so about two months and you're looking at just under a million bans uh cory are you surprised and overall uh is that enough i guess is is, is really my real question um, I've always been a fan of a real hardline stance on cheating and on toxic behavior in games in my mind if you cheat the game once you are banned, you're gone. If you use a, a slur once in a game, we have technology that can analyze what you said. If you say it once, you are gone. We don't give second chances. It's an obvious thing that you shouldn't be doing. If you are doing it, you are intentionally taking a wrong action, and you should be punished for it. So, yes, I'm happy to see this. Uh, you asked me if we could do more. Yeah, find the rest of them. Yeah, uh, and and really, actually, that kind of uh, that kind of touches on a conversation I had probably with myself back on the third. But uh, Xbox and well, I should say Microsoft and by extension Xbox, they laid out their community guidelines for acceptable trash talk because trash talk uh, can get very heated. It can get very uh, it can get very offensive. So Microsoft laid out some some. I would call it PG rated trash talk where, you know, uh, what's acceptable and what isn't. Uh, it was kind of funny just to kind of poke about, you know, poke at, uh, you know, po poke at things that obviously in a press release and something that's going out to the public, Microsoft is going to be very careful in what they type. But I, but I said during that little conversation with myself that I'm all for, not even so much policing the community and saying what's what is acceptable or how a community should act but i'm more for the fact 
what can get you banned? That should be very clear and very, very upfront about what gets you in trouble and what the reaction is. Where if you say, like you said, a slur or any kind of, you know, anything racist, sexist, homophobic, whatever, if you say something like that and you are very clear upfront that, hey, that's unacceptable, we'll ban you for six weeks, then, hey, you should ban them for six weeks for the first offense. I, I'm all for that kind of policing. Yeah, absolutely. I feel the exact same way. Um, again, my thought on it is always like when you say or do something like this, you know you shouldn't. Like, th- there's no <laughs> place you? on this planet that wants you to say the in world n word. Like, it's just well, certain place. Wouldn't talk about those. Those are gross. Uh, when you're playing games online, if you use a slur, if you cheat, you know you're doing something wrong. There's no excuse. You should be punished. Right. That right easy. Now, you're, you're you're absolutely right and uh and everyone hey that's uh I, we're gonna end it on a low note but everyone thank you for listening to the computer america show on our gamer tuesday uh cory gallagher pop Zara, if you want to check out more of his writing we'll have a link to his articles in the show notes and Corey, i'll let you have the last word if people want to find more of you where can they go uh oh. sorry ben you're cutting out but uh thank you for having me <laughs> Yeah, oh, so, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, and, and everyone will have links to everything in the, uh, in, in the show notes. Everyone, uh, thank you so much, Computer America. Hey, we'll catch you next time. Bye-bye, everyone.